So today I want to talk about three things. Say three things. Everything works in three. God, Father, Son. <sighs> Hallelujah. Trinity is three. Everything is in three. So I have three points today. It's purpose, providence, and perseverance. Everyone say purpose. 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 Providence. providence. Good. Do you know what providence is? Providence, you find it in the word provide. But providence is from a higher deity that gives you backing. That means God backs you and he provides for you. We want providence. We want God to back us. Hallelujah. Amen. Can I get an amen? amen? Do you want God to give you everything that you need? Do you want God to be behind you when you walk? Perseverance. What is perseverance? It means keeping your head up even though you don't even have a neck anymore. It means not giving up when everything around you says give up. It means pushing forward when everything inside you wants to push backwards. Perseverance. Are you in Romans 5? It says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have success, access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Amen. Thank you. I was waiting for one amen. And patience experience, and experience hope. And hope makes not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Hallelujah. For we were yet without strength. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will someone die, yet preadventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love towards us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Talking about the faithfulness of God. Mm. Even though when you were at your worst, God still saw you yeah. worth it. Amen. Say, I'm worth it. You're worth it, man. Amen. You have it. God sees you. God knows what is inside you. That's why he gave his son, so that you can be redeemed by grace, by faith, not by the law, not by your workings, not by your doings. Come on, we are all human beings. How many of us have tried to be a perfect human being? I see that smile. <laughs> And guess what? Like, maybe one week goes by and you, you get all the boxes ticked and you start feeling good. It's like, hey, I'm getting it. Two weeks goes by. Hey, I'm getting it. And then you get a phone call from someone you don't want and the next thing is the dog runs in front of your car and then you get to the highway and someone drives in front of you. And that good person that you've been for the last three weeks, instantly, died, and he's no longer with you anymore. So as long as it depends upon you to become righteous, you will come short. You will always fall short of the glory if you look at yourself for the answer. My goodness. So God commanded his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. Wow. Now, I don't know about you, but this scripture is enough for me to meditate on the whole day and just go to sleep tonight and be thankful, knowing that I am saved from the wrath of God. It is a terrible thing to fall into the wrath of God. It is, it is a terrible thing. My goodness, my goodness. But we are saved from that by the blood. For if when we were enemies, we are reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. 
And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgressions, who is the figure of him who was to come, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For it, through the offense of many, be dead, much more the grace of God, and the gift of grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, has abounded unto many. Wow, you are included in that many. The gift abounds unto you today so that you can be saved, not by your goodness, not by your greatness, but by his gift of love. Come on. For God so loved us. For God so loved you that he gave Jesus to become the sacrifice once and for all for you. So this morning, we want to talk about purpose. Are you in Nehemiah? Let's go to Nehemiah. The words of the story of Nehemiah, Nehemiah, now I'm getting confused. The son of Helkiah, now in the month of Cheslev, in the 20th year of the Persian king, as I was in the castle of Shushan, one of the kingsmen came with certain men from Judea, and I asked them about the surviving Jews who had escaped exile about Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant, everyone says the remnant, there in the province who escaped exile are in great trouble and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and his fortified gates are destroyed by fire. Wow. Destruction and reproach is upon the people. So, Jerusalem is the city of God, is the holy place. It is the place that God called for his people. God brought his people out of Egypt gave them the promised land, and over and over and over, the people of God turned their backs on God, stiffened their necks, and started worshiping other gods. So what happens through disobedience is destruction comes in play. Wherever there is disobedience, there will be destruction. Destruction is the result of disobedience, but destruction is also a catalyst for something new. Because something new always rises up out of the old. When something is destroyed, it can remain destroyed, or someone can have a heart to renew it. I want to bring your attention to Isaiah 58, verse 12. Verse 11, it says, You shall be like a watered garden whose waters fails not. And he carries on, he carries on. Verse 12, he says, those that be of you will be the restorers of the ancient dwellings, the repairers of roads to walk in, the ones that will restore the bridge. Now, I want to pay attention to this prophecy because this prophecy is what was given to my father in the beginning of his ministry. This is why it is there on the wall, because this is the foundation of this house. You shall be a water garden whose waters faileth not. This word is so true in this day, because if you go pick up any of my father's sermons, you'll be watered. His water is not failing. The streams that he has opened is eternal. It is forever. It is overflowing. But there is a purpose for this house. There is a purpose for us here today, but we don't understand the times that we are in, and we don't understand purpose. This is what I've been given during the past few days. Because we think that purpose is something that we can just think of. We can find purpose. Purpose is not something that can be think of, thought of. It is something that needs to be discovered. The next part of that prophecy in verse 12, it says, they that be of you, those that be shall from you. So that means he is the water garden, but then the ones coming from will be the repairers 
of ancient ruins, the restorers of pastor walking, the rebuilders of the bridges. Wow. Okay. Uh, I don't know about you, but um, the, the, the guest needs to start yeah. clicking to understand what time we are in. From the beginning that I had to stand up here, it is about redigging the wells, restoration. How many times has God given his word about restoration? Why? Because there has been destruction. <laughs> but I can truly say we are in the middle of the restoration process. It's no longer waiting for it to come. For years and years, we've been crying, we've been praying, restore, restore, renew. Amen. And last week, was it last week, the week before, in our fast and prayer week, I just realized, but we are in the middle of it. Amen. God's presence is here. His anointing is here. Amen. Healings are flowing. I don't know how many of you have noticed how many healings have been happening in the last year in this house. Hallelujah. Haven't been making a big spectacle of it because I believe healing should flow. You are the ones that should be flowing with the healings in your hands. Amen. Come on, when this house is full, you must be the people ministering to the people. Amen. God is bringing people together. Amen. If you are here right now, it means God has a purpose for you being here. Amen. So understanding the times that we are in is knowing that those that be of you, this is us. We are called to be restorers. We are called to this house to be repairers. My goodness. My goodness. It says, the remnant there in the province who escaped exile are in great trouble and reproach. I don't know about you, but you the last few years, man, I was in great trouble. <laughs> Ooh, I was in so much trouble that I wanted to run away many times. This is why I said you must say thank you to my wife, because if I didn't have a pillar like hers, I would have ran away. So the exiles were in great trouble and reproach, and the wall of Jerusalem is broken down. And when I heard this, I sat down and wept and mourned for days and fasted and prayed constantly before the God of heaven. Mm. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God, who keeps covenant, loving kindness, and mercy for those who love him and keep his commandment, let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open to listen to the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you day and night. For the Israelites, your servants, confessing the sins of the Israelites which have sinned against you. Yes, I am my father's house, have sinned. You see Nehemiah's heart here. The first thing that he does is he prays and he even repents for other people's sins. <laughs> This is important to, to take note of his heart at this moment. Verse 7, he says, We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept your commandments, statutes, and ordinances which you have commanded your servant Moses. Remember what you commanded your servant. Uh, if you transgress and are unfaithful, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though the outcasts were in the farthest part of the heavens, uh, yet I will gather them from there and will bring them to the place in which I have chosen to set my name. Amen. God's name cannot be defiled. And it will not be put to shame. Now, God has chosen a place to set his name. Wow. <laughs> this is beautiful. No, that place is not Jerusalem in the Far East. So if you are planting trees there, I'm sorry for you. It's not going to do anything for you. God has placed his name upon you. Yes. Come on, Isaiah 61. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Yes. Read on further, and they shall call you Zion, the holy city of God. God has placed his name upon you. Lucas. Above your name stands Elohim. God has placed his name on every single one of us. Uh, it's important to understand this. 
says, O Lord, verse 11, ah, verse 10, now these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. Verse 11, O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and the prayer of your servant who delights to revere and fear your name, your nature and your attributes. And prosper, I pray you, your servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. For I was the cup bearer to the king. Wow, okay. We need to add into our prayer lives, Lord, prosper me, your servant, so that I can do what is expected of me. Come on, come on. The next part, chapter 2. So in the month of, yes, I'm not sure why it's Nissan. I would love it to be BMW, but it's Nissan. In the month of Nissan, in the 20th year of King Arthur, when the wine was before him, I took up wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad before in his presence. So the king said to me, why do you look sad since you are not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of the heart. Then I was very afraid. And the king said, let the king live forever. Why should I not be sad-faced when the city, the place of my father's sepulture, lies waste and his fortified gates are consumed by fire? The king said to me, for what do you ask? Verse 4, come on. Let's stop there for a second. The king, Nehemiah comes out of a, a very difficult time. His father's house is destroyed. The house of his worship is destroyed. The house of his faith is destroyed. His people is scattered. And he is sad, man. The, the word says that he fasted and prayed many days for this. And he says, Lord, grant unto your servant, make your servant to prosper and give me favor. The next, the next part that I'm taking you to is in chapter 2, verse 4. The king said unto me, for what do you ask? Now, we all want favor with kings. We want to we wanna walk into a place and expect people to ask us, what do you want? But you have not made your request known to God. See, God works with the hearts of the people that you will approach. So first of all, you need to have time with God. You need to have favor with God before you find favor with men. How do you find favor with God? By understanding what your purpose is. Purpose is not something that comes when you have a well-balanced life and everything is going good and all your accounts are in the green. Purpose is not birth in that place. Purpose is birth in a place of pain. Come on. You only find purpose when something is broken. You only find purpose when something needs to be fixed. Otherwise, there is no purpose. Come on, the great commission Jesus gives to his disciples is go out, preach the kingdom, heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead. From the beginning of time, there was purpose, and it was birth in pain. But, uh, yo, Petrus, when are you going to preach again about everything's going to be good and nothing's going to go wrong with us? No, we need, we need to know that Everything that we go through is building us up into what God has called us for. Why do you think there are scriptures that says, don't worry. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That should give you a picture that you're going to face some things. So when the king asked him, what do you ask? And then he replies, so I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to him, if it pleases the king, if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you will send me to Judah, to the city of my father's sepulcher, that I may rebuild it. Come on. Now what follows here is um, the king is sitting with the queen, and he hears uh, Nehemiah's story, and he has favor with Nehemiah. Why? Because Nehemiah already put in time with God. 
the way was already prepared for him. He discovered his purpose when the destruction of Jerusalem was there. Ah, my goodness. We want purpose in our lives. But we need to understand purpose is birth in despair. And life without purpose is meaningless. Okay, so for everything that we go through, for all the pains that we experience, instead of trying to get out of it, sometimes we must just sit and think, maybe God is creating purpose in us. Come on. Driving through Stillfontaine every morning now, my heart is grieved. I'm sore about the condition of our land. I'm full of sorrow. Something needs to happen. That is where purpose is birth. When we start feeling this way. This is not right, man. This is not right what's happening to our country. It's not right, the stealing, the killing, and the destructions. It is not right. God has called us to this land. God has called you to South Africa. Why? (laughs) To be a light to this world, man. So you have purpose. It starts off with you and me. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, so what happens next is uh, the the king gives letters to Nehemiah because he asks, can I get a letter so that no one will stop me on my way passing through your country? He says, yes, you can have that letter. He says, oh, okay. Can I get a letter that I can get wood (laughs) from your forest? He says, yes. Can I get a letter that I can get rocks from your quarry? The king gives him everything that he needs, even though it's got nothing to do with the king. Nehemiah wants to restore Jerusalem. How does King Xerxes, what's his name there, give supplies to a different kingdom to be built? It's only by the favor of God. Now, we talk about purpose, and uh, I think this is what I want to bring over today, is we want to sit down and wait on God. Amen? It's nice to sit and wait. Hallelujah. What are you doing, brother? No, I'm just waiting on the Lord. I'm waiting for the next move. Up until now, I have not received instructions of what to do. Man, I would love a 10-point plan, but God has not given me a five-point plan even. He's not even given me a two-point plan. He's given me one word. One word is all I have. One word is all that I'm running with. God doesn't dish out plans. I'm sorry. You can wait as long as you want to. You're not going to receive a plan. Yes, our mindly, earthly nature wants to know, tomorrow I'm going to do this. Tuesday I'm going to do this. I have a five-year plan. This is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. Oh, Lord. Lord. And we waste so much time sitting and waiting on God while God has already said, go. You see, purpose is not revealed to you. It is revealed through you. God doesn't give you purpose. He births purpose within you. This is where we need to change our minds because we are sitting, waiting, reading the Bible from back to back, looking for purpose while it's within us. Verse 9, Then I came to the governors beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had set captains of the army of the horsemen with me. And verse 10, When Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the servant, and the Ammonite heard of it, It grieved them exceedingly that there was 
come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. So I came to Jerusalem, and there was three days. And I arose in the night, and some of the men with me, neither told I any man what God, come on, say, what God had put in my heart. Sometimes what God puts in your heart, you need to shh, just for a little bit, and start looking. <laughs> Not everything God drops in your heart is to be shared with everyone. There is a time for that. But first of all, what he does is he goes and looks what needs to be done. Before he just starts saying, ah, this is what we're going to do. We're going to repair. We're going to do this. We have these five plans. We have, this is our five-year plan that we're going to do with this and this and this. This is how we're going to, no. Wait. God needs to take you to the journey to see you cannot announce what God shows you before you cannot see it. So verse 17, Then I said to them, See, you did the stress that we are in now in Jerusalem, lies to waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we will be no more a reproach. And then I told them of the hand of God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, let us rise up and build. Woo. Okay, so he's getting the people together and tells them, God's good is upon me. And here is the king's words as well to back me. So if you don't believe God is on me, here is our provision from the king next door. <laughs> ah. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. Come on. You need to strengthen your hands. When you hear the word of God, there comes a time where you need to strengthen your hands. No, you need to strengthen your hands because there is work to be done. Where there is purpose, there is work. Where there is work, there is strength needed. <laughs> Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. But when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Ammonite and Geshem, the Abraham, heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, what is this king, what is this thing that you do? Will you rebel against the king? Come on. There are Sanballats and Tobias in this age that we are in. This I answered them and said unto them, the God of heaven, he will prosper us. Amen. Therefore, come on, <laughs> the God of heaven will prosper us. If you step into your purpose, you can say with boldness, the God of heaven will prosper me. Because Sanbalats will always try and mock you so that you will start to doubt your purpose and start you to doubt what you are doing. Man, this is, this is good. The Amplified says it this way. It says, The God of heaven has appointed us for his purpose and will give us success. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. But you have no portion, right, or memorial in Jerusalem. <sighs> the Sanballats, the things that mocks you, the things that wants to distract you, have no portion in you. Don't let the voices and the distractions of the things in this world deter you from what you are called to do, from your purpose. Now, in reading Nehemiah 1 and 2, I want to ask you, where did God instruct Nehemiah to do any of these things? Nowhere is there instruction from God to do this. It was birthed within him. And when we read it in the Amplified, it says, the God of heaven has appointed us for his purpose and will give us success. Amen. Come on. I believe we're going to do so much more when we stop waiting and start doing. Yes. It's a challenging word, yes. 
because we want to see and feel before we do. What does the word say? It says, uh, we walk by faith and not by sight. (laughs) That's a challenging word. Because we want the plan. We want to know that, hey, I'm secure in what I'm doing. Nehemiah was not secured in what he was doing. Nehemiah was not protected. Because if we start reading the story further, (laughs) this Sanballat and the Tobia started attacking him while they were working. Whenever you are busy with a purpose that is birthed within you, there will be attacks. Hallelujah. Chapter 4. But it came to pass that when Sanballat heard, <laughs> now the whole of chapter 3, <laughs> if, you read, if you read this whole book, you find chapter 3, there are so many people that started working on this and this and this and this and this part. Because with purpose, God brings people together. Amen. And there are people that is ready for the work. The people said, this is good. Let us build. Strengthen our hands for this work that is up ahead. Chapter 3, you read the whole building. And chapter 4, it says, When it came to pass, then Sambalat heard that we were building the wall. (laughs) They were wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. And he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? And will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? And now Tobiah the Ammonite was with him and said, Even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. (laughs) Come on. There will always be someone that wants to mock you, that wants to ridicule you, and that wants to make what you are doing of no significance. But you... Your purpose is between you and God. Your purpose is given by God, birthed within you, and that is between you and God. Why will you stand aside and let someone else's word change your mind of what God has called you to do? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. It says, hear the word of our, hear, o, our God, for we are despised, and turn their reproach upon their own heads, and give them for a prey in the land of captivity, and cover not their iniquity, and let not their sin be blotted out from before them, for they have provoked you to anger before the builders. So we built the wall, and all the wall was joined together until the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. For the people had a mind to work. Come on. I'm bringing you back to the prophecy of this house. Those that be of you shall be the rebuilders of ancient ruins, the restorers of pastor walking, the repairers of the bridge. And the people had a mind to work. God is busy adding people to this house with a mind to work. God is raising up people and joining people to this house for the work that is and I don't think you even know the work that is up ahead for this house. Last weekend, we were hearing Jedediah, the beloved one, beautiful, And for the first time, a prophet came in and prophesied over the house. I was like, yes, Lord. And he said, great changes are coming. Great changes are coming, even cosmetically. And I'm like, wow, okay. The Lord knows I want to do a lot in this house, but now it's released. Now it has to happen. 
No, it has to happen. My goodness. Soon we're going to have aircons in this house and you're going to sit awake right throughout everything. Soon things are going to change in this house because the word has been released. Now if the word has been released in this house, the ones that is joined into this house, it goes into the house. Man. Man. You think the people had a mind to work just because they're going to work and, ah, we did a great work there because the work they do there benefits them. When the temple is restored, their houses are restored. When the temple's riches are restored, their riches are restored. When the temple's peace is restored, their peace is restored. Because when there is a scattering, where is the destruction, everyone is to their own. Everyone is hiding in their own homes. Come on, just look at what COVID has done to the church world. Everyone is just scattered. Does everyone have peace? Does everyone have victory? Or does everyone have prosperity? No. Because there has been a separation. Why? Because people are disobedient. Yes. We have been disobedient. But how gracious is God? When we turn again, He is merciful to forgive. I mean, just think about the story of the prodigal son. When the father saw him afar off, he started running. This is God's heart towards us. Even though he cannot go back on his word, God's word, he cannot change his word. He said, if you turn from me, you will be scattered. But if you turn back to me, I'll bring you back from all the corners of the earth. And I will put you back in the land that I have promised you, that I have set my name upon. Ah, oh, Lord, have mercy. For the people had a mind to work. Verse 7. But it came to pass then when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites and the Cellulites heard that the walls of Jericho were made up, and that the breaches began to be stopped, they were very wroth. They will mock you, and they will ridicule you until they start seeing, hey, Carl has made some great progress here. This is not a joke anymore. Wow. Do not give Sanbulats and the Tobias, do not give them your airtime. Do not even pick up the phone. You you know, the problem with with us is that we want to justify ourselves. And we have a scripture for everyone that mocks us. You know, Sanballats, they don't need attention. They don't need justification. They're going to be there for one reason, for one reason only. To see you prosper and to be defeated. But if you give them your attention, (laughs) man, they will take from you. So what happens next is they conspired against them and they started hiring prophets (laughs) to bring in bad accusations against them. Verse 13, therefore, Said I in the lower places beyond the wall and on the higher place, even said on the people, their families with their swords. And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to do the rest of the people, be not afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible and fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters and your wives and your houses. And it came to pass when our enemies heard that it was known unto us and God had brought their counsel to naught, that we returned all of us to the wall, every one of us to work. This is after Sanblat and Tobiah sent in people to fight them so that they can stop the progress that they are making. Uh, Nehemiah just sends out the people with the spears and the swords to just stand post. And then this part in verse 15, the Amplified. When our enemies heard that their plot was known to us and that God had frustrated their purpose. Come on. 
I'm saying the enemy is real, the attacks are real, but God will frustrate the ones that's plotting against you. There's a frustration coming into the enemy's camp today. Frustration is entering into your enemy's camp. Frustration is entering your enemy's camp. You will see the frustration on their faces tomorrow. They will not know what hit them. And whatever they're talking about about you will turn into your good. And from that time on forth, half of my servants worked with the task and the other held their spear, shield, bows, and coats of mail. And the leaders stood behind all the house of Judea. Those who built the wall and those borders uh, loaded themselves so that everyone worked with one hand and held a weapon with the other hand. Okay. Thank you, Lord. Bring you back to the time that we are in the process of restoration that we need to do, and the rebuilding. And we don't have the luxury to have the specialized ones that can lay bricks perfectly. No, everyone is called to the work. Yeah. Everyone is called to the work. Amen. And not only the work, you have to be a fighter as well. What is the sword? The sword is the word of God. Common. Ephesians talks about the armor. It says, the sword is the word of faith. It's the word of God. So we cannot build without defending. Defending what? This house? No. Okay. If God decides to send a tornado and this house is gone tomorrow, the house is gone. I'm talking about something much more precious than a building made with stones. I'm talking about you. We are talking about rebuilding. What are we rebuilding, guys? There's two ways you can look at this today. Yes, this building needs a lot of maintenance, but I'm looking at the building over here. This building needs a lot of repair. As much as we need to put work into this building, we need to put work in this building. How, how many of you have gone out and testified? How many of you have started bringing people into the house of God? So that's what I'm saying. We are scattered. Oh, yeah. Purpose is birth. It is not given to you. It is birthed in you. Three things that we learn out of the story of Nehemiah is one, disobedience brings destruction. In chapter nine, Ezra starts speaking and he says, because of our fathers that have stiffened their necks and turned away from your commandments, this is why you have dealt to us accordingly. And it's right that you have dealt to us this way. But your word also says, if we turn to you, you will bring us together. So obedience brings restoration, and disobedience brings destruction. Number two, God always backs a purpose-driven person. That is what we find in chapter 2, verse 20, where it says, God will prosper us because we are doing the purpose that he has given to us. Even the king will supply unto us. God always backs a purpose-driven person. What is your purpose? Don't give the enemy the pleasure of your attention. Whew, hallelujah, distractions. The enemy would like to distract you from your purpose. Don't give him your attention. Come on. 
if you go through the story of Nehemiah, you, you find that Sanballat, he, he makes up a story and he says that you are conspiring against the king and wada, 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 and he, he sends messengers to him and says, come meet me, let us, let us talk this out. Let us talk this out, otherwise I'm going to tell that king that gave you everything that you are conspiring against him. Nehemiah refuses him five times. He just, he, he doesn't even send word back. When you are busy with the work, be so busy that you don't even care what other people are saying. When you are busy with something, why, why would you want to stop and defend what you are doing? Ooh, hallelujah. The story of Jeremiah, how many of you know Jeremiah 29, 29 verse 11? For I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you. But do you know that just before that plans that God gives, God gives Jeremiah a command to tell Jerusalem, I'm going to destroy you. So just after a prophecy of destruction comes the plans of God. Wow, destruction is necessary. Destruction is very necessary in our lives. Not, not too long ago, we went through a, a very difficult process here with the school and the church. And at a point, I saw a lot of crazy things happening. And uh, do you know what a pointer is? It's a dog that points. <laughs> now, I have a beautiful pointer, but I bought two of them. It was a male and a female. And uh, in the middle of all these difficult things that is going on, for some reason, the spirits went into the staff. Now, I love my staff, they're beautiful, but everyone was fighting with one another that day. And I just decided something is wrong in this house. And we need to fix it. I don't know how, but we need to fix it. You know when something is wrong in your house. Right? You need to do something. Okay. So get everyone together. We're going to do something right now. And then I started hearing this and this and this and this, and I'm just confused, like completely confused. And in the middle of this, I'm getting a WhatsApp from my wife that my two baby pointers, which was, I think, three months old, decided they want to go hunt, and they caught one of my lambs. And they sent me a photo of the lamb where there's just skin left. All the beautiful stuff is gone. The inside is eaten out. Yeah. Okay, that's one of my new lambs, which I like my lambs. I don't know about you, but when I get a new lamb, I love my lambs because it provides meat later on. So I was angry. Now, I don't know how you would feel in that situation, but my first thought was, I'm going to get my two dogs, I'm going to drag them to my sheep, I'm going to get a stick, and I'm going to teach them that this is not food. Okay, for all the SPCA lovers, you can, I didn't do it, so you can do nothing against me. It's premeditated, but nothing happened. <laughs> yes, you guys are holy. I see no one of you beat your animals. <laughs> now, this happens in the middle of chaos. Like, I don't know, I don't know how to explain the chaos that we were in that day. It was, it was chaos. In the middle of that chaos, I'm getting this. Everyone's still shouting and screaming, but like the volumes fade down. It's like I'm just looking at this. I'm like, how is this possible that right now this happens? And I'm thinking, it's like, man, I'm going to beat them, I'm going to do that. And right there, God speaks to me. And he says to me, what type of dogs did you buy? I said, pointers. He says, what is a pointer? It's a hunter. It's like, I'm sorry, Lord. I'm learning something here. The word says, I have created the destroyer to destroy. Destroy what? We go through life and we add so many things to the purpose that God has given to us. Man, I'm standing afresh here today and I, I'm... I'm ready for the purpose of this house. I'm ready to rebuild. I'm ready to restore. 
but I know, I know in 20 years from now, God is going to have to remove things from me because me, myself, we build things with that. We add things together. And that's why distraction comes in, to remove the things that is not pure. Remove the things that is not holy. Yes, it is, it is God that destroys. <laughs> and we, we cry so hard when the destruction comes. But we have to realize that God will never let us be defeated. God will never let us go down. Now, if we go through the Old Testament, you find the story of the temple and Jerusalem being destroyed over and over. You find the story of Israelites being saved and then forgetting God over and over. But that was a physical temple. The temple was a, a foreshadow of what was to come. So right now, you are the temple. You are the city of God. Come on, why, why do you think Jesus comes and he says, you see this temple, destroy it, remove it completely, and I will rebuild it in, in three days. I mean, they were, they were laughing. Sun Balats just rose up there and all the Pharisees and the Sadducees, like, ah, what are you saying? It took us 40 years to build this thing. Are you going to do it in three days? He says, because I'm going to remove the natural and I'm going to establish the spiritual. Amen. Come on. When Jesus was sitting at the well, he says, where, where shall we worship? He says, the time is coming where you will not go to this or that temple, but where true worshipers will worship God in spirit and in truth. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. John 14. It says, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. And where I go, you know the way. And Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not where you go. How can we know the way? And Jesus says to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. If you had known me, you should have known the Father also. And from henceforth you know him and have seen him. So the temple of old days was to have the presence of God. Now in the new, we have a temple for the presence of God, which is not a man-made temple, because God does not anymore live in temples made with hands, but he lives in you and me. You are vessels of God. Ah, thank you, Lord. So we no longer have to rebuild Jerusalem. Thank you, Jesus, because they're going to keep on shooting it. They rejected the Son of God. <laughs> Unless they changed. I'm sorry. I was live. Hallelujah. I'm not pro-Israel at all, Gaza. I'm pro-kingdom. Yo, very quiet now. Very, very quiet. Oh, I'm not here for politics. I'm here for the kingdom. Amen. Matthew 5:17. So this is after Jesus comes and he gives the manifesto of the kingdom. I love Matthew 5. Verse 17, he says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Okay. So in the old, you have to have the law in order to be atoned. Come on. What I said is, destruction is good to renew. When you want to revamp something, if you want to revamp a house, 
If you come into a house, you know the guys in the 70s had great taste, but it's not working for today. So if you buy a house that was built in the 70s, the kitchen is not going to be pleasing unto you right now. Yeah. Unless you like it. I don't know how you're going to like it, but it was weird style back then. <laughs> what needs to be done is everything needs to be ripped out. Before you can start, you cannot build on the old. Okay. I'm not saying you rip out the foundations of the house because you need that. I'm just saying you rip out the things that is not... Uh, That is not appropriate for this time. Understanding our times. Thank you, Lord. So he says, I've not come to destroy. So it cannot be rebuilt. Because if it is destroyed, it can be rebuilt. But when it's fulfilled, it is complete. Oh, my goodness. For very last sentence, till heaven and earth pass, not one judge title shall in no wise pass from the law till all will be fulfilled. So Jesus came and he fulfilled the law so that we never have to be in that position again where we have to work for our righteousness, where we have to work to be accepted, where we have to work to get free of our sins. No, so what work do we have? <laughs> Our work is different. Our work is for the kingdom. Our work is in people. Come on, you see the empty chairs around you. You've got work to do. We've got work to do in the kingdom of God. We have to build this together. But you have to have, to have mind to work. Thank you, Lord. Let's jump to Hebrews 10. Simon, are you here? Before we get to Hebrews 10, I just want to recap on the story of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was moved with sorrow in his heart because of what has happened in Jerusalem. He went and fasted and prayed and asked God, <laughs> God, please forgive me and forgive the people and turn again and restore. A heart full of purpose will always be a heart full of repentance. Yeah. You'll see before there is a great move there is a spirit of repentance that comes into our house. Oh, but me, I have nothing to repent for. Are you sure about that? You holy saint. Well, if you have nothing to repent for, just repent for our president or something. I don't know. <laughs> Repent for me for trying to eat the dog. <laughs> I'm a sinner. <laughs> God always backs a purpose-driven person. You can. We need the story. Nehemiah didn't add a Bible. He, he didn't understand the purposes of God. He just had a heart and all these things. We might not understand the time we're in, but if you can align your heart with the purposes of God. Petrus has been talking about purpose. We're going to step now into the purpose of God because this point in history was the greatest turning point in the Old Testament. For Artaxerxes was the son of Esther and Ahasuerus. And Daniel came to Babylon when he was 16. And he was in Babylon 70 years. 
he was 60, he was 86 when he wrote Daniel. And he says here in Daniel 9.25, the biggest prophecy ever written on Christ. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah Prince shall be 70 weeks of seven. If you, if you have any understanding of the patterns of the Bible, you will realize we have just stepped into the purposes of God that is going to work on this earth. God said to me so clearly, this place is going to be a lighthouse. I can never, ever forget it. When I was lying here, he said to me, do whatever you can because this will be a light in a very dark world. And I have just heard the call for people to come and rebuild the wall and to stand because the things of God, the purposes of God, listen guys, we're so stuck in the stories and it's my purpose, me, 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 me. But when you start stepping into this, you're stepping into His purpose and you're stepping into the greatest purpose ever. The greatest words in the Bible is in Him. We cannot stay stuck. Christ in me, the hope of glory. Now we have to step in Him. Nehemiah didn't have a Bible and he could not understand. But now the angel comes and he says, I want you to know and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Ah. So our walk is a walk not of sight, but of faith. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> Are you ready? Are you willing? Are you able? Lord, strengthen our hands for the work. Strengthen our hands for the work. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, here towards the end of Nehemiah, you'll, you'll find he says, Lord, remember me for the good that I have done for your people. <laughs> I think this must be the desire of our hearts is to have a prayer like that. Lord, remember me for the good that I've done for your house and for your people. You see, the purpose of God will always be greater than your abilities. That's why there's never a clear plan because it will never work out the way you seem it fit. God's purpose will always be greater than your abilities. So I, I think it's time to, to let go of trying to do it, knowing that I cannot do this. But God, God is backing me every step of the way. God is for me. Thank you, Jesus. Hebrews 10. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered because they that worship once purged should have no conscience of sin. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he comes into the world and he says, Sacrifice and offering, you would not, but a body you have prepared for me. Ha, my goodness. 
In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, for it is written of me, to do your will, O God. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you would not, neither have you pleasure therein, where you are offered by the law. Then he said, Lo, I come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second, by the which <laughs> will we are sac uh, sanctified through the offering of the blood of Jesus Christ once and for all. And every priest stands daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifice, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, yeah, wow, okay. That's where I, I, I was expecting some excitement. Forever. He sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness uh, to us. For after they had said before, this is the covenant I will make with them, after those days, said the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts, and into their minds I will write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of there is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the Holy of Holies by the blood of Jesus. Come on. I'm, I'm bringing this all together for you to show you Nehemiah out of his passion for God and for the house of God. He laid down everything to rebuild a temple that was going to be done away in any way. Yeah. He was driven by purpose for that. Jesus comes and he says, I have not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. Why the temple was there <laughs> is without the temple, they could not enter into the promise. Without the offering for sin, year after year after year, their sins will just heap up and they know at the end is the wrath of God waiting for them. So that was the purpose of the temple. Even though God's presence was there, the main purpose was to get rid of sins. Now, we have a new and a living way. We have Jesus which offered once and for all. <laughs> and here in verse 17, he says, that their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. Now where remission of there is, there is no more offering for sin. No more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest of holies by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the profession of our hope, without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Okay. What I'm bringing to you in this part is God's presence is not there for you to repent of your sins. The holiest of holies is not for you to come in and have the atmosphere right and then repent of your sins. No, you just say, Lord, I'm sorry, I sinned. But when you step into the holiest of holies, when you step into his presence, you are there to commune with him, to meet with him, to have fellowship with the Father. What the temple is actually made for is to have that, that time with God where all the things are just left behind. Come on. We as humans, we have thoughts. We have things that we have done wrong. We have a conscience that keeps on nagging us. This is what Jesus did. We can leave everything beside and say, Lord, here I am. 
I, I don't know if that picture makes sense to you right now. What a price Jesus paid for us to be able to do that. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willing after that we have received the knowledge of truth, there remains no more sacrifice for our sins. So not forsaking the assembly of ourselves, as the manner of some is. So why, why is that there? <laughs> and yes, God does not live in temples made with hands. Can you see him help me the tofels? And I, I've, I've heard so many people say that church is not important. that um, <laughs> they do not need anybody to teach them because they have the Spirit of God. But then I look at their lives and I'm like, but I don't see the power of God. The power of God is manifested in the body of God. Come on, we've been talking about the kingdom lately as well. God does not entrust the fullness of the kingdom to a single entity. The only one that could carry that was Jesus. You will slip and miss it and ruin it. God will not entrust everything to one person. That's not how He works. But when we are together, you see, you are the temple, right? So I am the temple. The Word tells you that you are now the temple. But you are also part of the body. The body has many members. And so the temple has many offices. Come on. Every one of us has a part to play in this house. Every one of us has a part to play in this restoration. Come on, the task ahead is, is great. And can we get the offering bucket here in front? With this, everyone that is watching as well, if your heart is stirred and you want to be part of this house, of this season, I want you to give. Because if you go through the story of Nehemiah, you'll find that the, the first fruits and the tithes and the offerings, the storehouses needed to be repaired. Nehemiah had to appoint people to take care of the offerings people needed to bring in order to restore. We need to restore. So there is much need. And as we take care of God's house, you know how it's going to work. God's going to take care of your house.